the tale Still some don't believe His sacrifice Was meant for you and me When you give a gift You can't make someone receive So many reject Thinking I'm not worthy As for me I feel differently As for me As for me Oh, how beautiful The display you'd give away your soul now my soul is safe what you went through I can conceive not just the son of God to me might not be so quick to conceive oh how beautiful the display oh no for me on that day inconceivable
I sat back waiting, anticipating at some point change would begin. And then it hit me, I was what was missing. My weight was dead, that's why we couldn't move ahead. But no more delays, it all ends today. It don't have to be so heavy if you pull your weight, you and I are the ones we've been waiting for. You and I thought this was somebody else's war. You and I are the ones, the ones we've been waiting for. Goodbye, a promise. Just hope change is coming. Well, hope alone won't bring about that change. God's heartbeat, God's hands and God's feet. Not in the flesh, let's bless full steam ahead. So no more it all can end It don't gotta be so heavy. Joining us this afternoon at First Plymouth's annual lecture series event. This is an event, it is a moment in time, it is a life-changing, transformative experience to encounter the faith, to encounter the spirit and the holy and one another in a new way. We've been in this particular space in our sanctuary, we've been planning across Zoom, across states, we've been praying and thinking and imagining better for our own communities, but for our own lives. And last night, many of us joined together um, from various communities across Denver. This is an interfaith multicultural event and an advisory board and representatives who represent the people and the individuals and the beauty of the whole. So we gathered here last night and heard amazing stories from three particular people, stories of racism and resilience, stories about the effect that change has on each of our lives when we allow those stories to intersect at places where race and ethnicity, where culture, where human sanctity and dignity, um, where harm has taken place or hatred has been allowed to kind of reign in our lives. So the First Plymouth Annual Lecture Series mission statement is really about building coalitions to affect change at the local level. And we have a commitment to bring prolific speakers who are working at the intersection of faith, justice, life, politics, like the Reverend Dr. Jackie Lewis and others whose voices you've already heard from and um, hopefully we're able to meet some of these individuals. But we are committed to doing this work at a grassroots local level because we know that we can each read books and we can invite um, wonderful members from other communities to talk into our space. But unless we allow those voices and the power of those stories to infiltrate our own holy sacred space, we will not leave changed. 
So this is not just an invitation to come hear a great lecture because you're gonna get that, right? And if that's the box you need to check today, great, right? You've done that. But there are so many more boxes. There are so many more places to explode the boxes. So this is an invitation to encounter the Spirit in a way that you can leave changed. And you can come back with someone else sitting on your left or your right. Because building coalitions means inviting people to participate in the change. Coalitions are not made from people who look just like us. Coalitions, I'm thinking of the Reverend Dr. William Barber, one of my mentors, who has built a fusion movement, right? It's people from all different places who've been discriminated against and oppressed and held back, right, from rising. Coalitions are built when we intersect at those places and we see the sacred in each other, right, to build the whole. So I'm not going to continue preaching the sermon. The pastor who didn't get to preach the sermon today is like preaching the sermon. So I'm going to um, begin and invite you into this space, but I hope you'll commit to yourself and to those who aren't here, but to the selves who have kind of lived half selves, right, because of the, the nature of the white supremacist culture that we've built, that you'll commit to those selves to leave here changed and to make sure that you'll bring somebody else with you the next time there's an opportunity to do this work together. I'm, in a moment, Dr. Eric Smith is going to introduce um, our musicians. But friends, take a deep breath in. Breathe in the breath of God. Slow your roll, slow your pace. And exhale slowly, releasing that all that keeps you from experiencing wholeness and God's peace and the beloved community. Good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me? Good afternoon, my name is Eric Smith. I am on the staff here at First Plymouth and also teach at the Isle of School of Theology. Yeah, I have the privilege today to introduce to you M. Roger Holland, M. Roger Holland II, who is teaching assistant professor in music and religion and director of the Spirituals Project at the Lamont School of Music, University of Denver. A graduate of Union Theological Seminary in New York City where he received the Master of Divinity degree Roger also served as artist in residence and director of the Union Gospel Choir for over 13 years. In 2015, Union awarded him the Trailblazers Distinguished Alumni Award, the first given to a graduate whose ministry is music for his contributions to the legacy of African-American music. He received a master's degree in piano performance from the Manhattan School of Music, also in New York, and completed his undergraduate work at Westminster Choir College in Princeton, New Jersey, where he majored in music education with a concentration in piano and voice. <clears throat> Roger is the newly appointed editor of the In Spirit and Truth series published by GIA Publications Incorporated, which reflects the aesthetic of black Catholic worship. Commissioned works include The Dream and the Dreamer, The Tribulation Suite, and The Call. Original music collections published by GIA include Building Up the Kingdom, featuring the single Worthy God, and his recent collection, Honey from the Rock, Volumes 1 through 4. He has played for the Broadway productions of Oprah Winfrey's The Color Purple and the Tony Award-winning show Memphis. In November 2016, Timothy Cardinal Dolan of the Archdiocese of New York presented Roger with the Pierre Toussaint Med Medallion for Service. I present to you M. Roger Holland II. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I didn't know they were gonna do that, and all I could think was that has nothing to do with what I'm about to enter into right now. So, I don't know where you all as a congregation, I see that most or all of us are not wearing masks. I see just one. Uh, we've been, as a people, going through some stuff. It's been quite a two plus years time. But what I want us to think about right now is even so, how blessed we are. And to think about what God has been doing. You know, just the fact that you're sitting here, there are others that are not in this place. And not because they didn't choose to come here today, but because they're somewhere six feet below the ground. Amen? 
And just the fact that you're here, the fact that you can hear me with at least one working ear, the fact that you can see me with some eyes, the fact that you understand what it is that I'm saying to you in this moment says that you're blessed beyond belief. God didn't have to do what God is doing in your life right now, but you have a reason to rejoice. You have a reason to give God thanks. You have a reason to give God praise. Amen? So I'm going to operate from my own tradition, and that, that, that's a little, no, I need to modify that because then I got to talk about black Catholic, but I'll put, let me put it this way. I'm going to operate from the place wherein I have been called to operate as a Christian brother who God has gifted, all right? And in that spirit, as a worship leader, I'm going to ask you not to sit there and look at me, but even if you don't catch on to the music I'm about to present, I'm going to ask you to stand and join me in spirit as we all come together and sing this song, We're Blessed. Wherever we are, wherever it is that we find ourselves, we are indeed blessed. And I brought my amen corn over there. It's going to help me. Come on, brother, Dr. Williams. Here we go, everybody. Oh, come on, come on and say blessed, 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 blessed. You already know that part. I want to hear you sing it. Come on, say
So here's the thing. I didn't come to just sing to and for you. Come on, brother. I came to worship God. I came to give God the very best that I have and to lift up the name of God and to praise God's holy name. Because God has been too good. God has been too wonderful. God has been too kind for all of us not to give every praise unto God. And that's what we want to lift up right now. Come on. Every praise. Every praise is to our God. Every word of worship. Every word of worship. One accord. One accord. Every praise. Every praise. Every praise. Every praise is to our God. We're going to sing hallelujah. Sing hallelujah. To our God. To our God. Sing glory. glory hallelujah. hallelujah. It's to our God. It's to our God. Every praise. Every praise. Every praise. Every praise. It's to our God. It's to our God. Come on, let's sing that again. Say every praise. Every praise. It's to our God. It's to our God. Every word of worship. Every Singing, sing hallelujah. Sing hallelujah to our God. To our God. Say glory hallelujah. Glory hallelujah. It's to our God. To our God. Say every praise. Listen, he 
You know, I remember when I first started leading worship in New York. Wasn't comfortable with doing it, but eventually I found my stride. And one of the things that I thought about with the song, one of the first worship songs that I learned was, welcome into this place. And I was puzzled, because I thought to myself, why would we welcome God into God's space? I said, if it's already God's house, why are we welcoming God into God's own house? I had a problem with that. And then I started to do some deep theological introspection, reflection, brother, now. And I thought to myself, well, if here, if this is the temple, if this is the space where the Holy Spirit can reside, it's not that we welcome God into this physical structure of four walls and a ceiling, but this space, our heart, our mind, our soul, those are places we can invite the spirit of the living God to dwell. Because those are the places that God does not force God's self into, but rather God waits for an invitation. I believe the scripture says, behold, I stand at the door and knock, yeah? Yes, and if anyone would welcome me, then I would come in. And so that is the thing. Because we serve an omnipresent God. God is all places at all times. So it doesn't make sense to welcome God. But, but then, you know, we get so busy. We get really busy and we forget that God is here. And so maybe we need to pause and remind ourselves that God is already here, and we just need to be, here's a big word, not really, but cognizant. We need to remind ourselves that God is in this place. So I'm inviting you right now to welcome God into this space, to recognize that God is already here as we say welcome. jacked up. So welcome, welcome into this broken vessel. Into this broken vessel. God, I believe it is your design to abide. to abide. Oh God, in the praises of these your people. And so we lift our hands.
might be different. This might not be comfortable. This might not be familiar to you. But I wonder if I can get some of you right now, and not just you and you and you in the back and y'all, but some of you that believe that God has done something for you and you have a grateful spirit just to speak it out loud. Don't worry about the person standing next to you, but just to say, God, I thank you. God, I worship you in this space. God, I'm so grateful for who you are. Some of y'all looking at me and smiling, but that's not what I'm looking for. I'm after you to not look at me, but to put yourselves in God's presence and ignore who I am. And don't worry about the person standing next to you. Oh, some of you are doing it already. You're worshiping God. You're giving God glory. You're giving God thanks. You're giving God praise because God has been too good. God has been too kind. God has been too awesome. He's been a deliverer for some of you. He's been an awesome way maker for some of you. Some of you have been through some things that God made a way out of nowhere. Oh, some of you have been sick that God healed your body. Just thank God for a moment. All right. Some of you don't want to talk. I understand. You're like, oh, I can't let nobody hear my voice. But I tell you what, close your eyes right now, just for a moment. See nobody but you and the Spirit of God. Everybody, come on, indulge me. Close your eyes. And I'm going to ask you to just either put your hands together in praise and make an applause. Or just lift up hands. Some of you are doing that already. And we're going to take 60, 60 seconds just to worship God. God, we bless you. God, we adore you. God, we magnify your name. Lord, we acknowledge that it is you who made us and not we ourselves. God, we acknowledge that we are the sheep of your passion. We are the flock that you got. God, we acknowledge that if it weren't for you, if it weren't for the goodness of the Lord, where would I be right now? If it weren't for you, God, that kept me safe on my way here, I didn't get into an accident, oh God. This gas in my tank, while it's $5 across the, I was able to put gas in my tank, and I'm grateful, God. Oh Lord, my feet work, my, my legs work. My ears work. My heart is still beating within my body. My mind still works, oh God. And I'm grateful. Hallelujah. Oh, Lord, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Lord. Oh, oh, Hallelujah. Amen. Please be seated in the presence of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. Friends, whoo, that's right. We are rearranging our schedule to make sure our beloved friend, Jackie Lewis, gets on her plane with her beloved husband, John. So. Without further ado, I want to introduce the Reverend Dr. Jackie Lewis, author, activist, and public theologian. She's the senior minister at Middle Collegiate Church, a multiracial, welcoming, and inclusive congregation in the New York City area that it's driven by love. And she said this this morning, love, period. Jackie is the author of several books, including her latest, Fierce Love. If you haven't read it, get it, read it. A Bold Path to Ferocious courage and rule-breaking kindness that can heal the world. Middle Church and Jackie have been featured in the media, such as the Today Show, Good Morning America, The Takeaway, The Brian Lehrer Show, and The Washington Post, New York Times, Wall Street Journal, and more and more and more. Her podcast includes Love, period, which is pro produced by the Center for Action and Contemplation, and The Four, a fearsome faith foursome, talking about black life, love, Power and Joy with Otis Moss III, Lisa Sharon Harper, that's right, and Michael Ray Matthews. Another thing I want you to do in your program, um, I want you to do this right now so you don't forget. Jackie is here because she's an amazing, fierce uh, preacher of the word and lover of all human beings and can knit those together, but she's also here on behalf of her congregation. Her historic, amazing building, building burnt to the ground a year plus ago 
during the pandemic. And so middle rising is an opportunity for you to participate in rebuilding, building back better their congregation, their historic church building. You can Venmo, you can go online, but please do support um, the congregation at Middle. One of my closest friends from seminary who works with Jackie is on staff there. Such an amazing beacon of hope for our community and for the communities at large. Please do make a contribution. Jackie is giving her own contributions for touring the world, you know, speaking and just lifting up this amazing message of love and reconciliation and healing. But there's a lot of resilience in there. They are going to need our community support from across these states and difference in time. And we don't know you, but you're our neighbor. So do lift up Middle Rising and Jackie and the work that she is doing in the world. So Reverend Dr. Jackie Lewis, we invite you now to share with us. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Hey. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you. Thank you, Roger Holland and Roger Holland's friends and all of y'all. That music was awesome! <laughs> Woo! How many of you were not here this morning? How many of you knew this afternoon? Just knew this afternoon? Okay, welcome, welcome, welcome. Welcome to this place. Um, I'm Jackie Lewis. I am the senior minister at Middle Church. My pronouns are she, her, hers. And I'm going to talk to us a bit about um, how we dismantle racism from the inside out. How we dismantle racism from the inside out. Now, I wasn't going to start with scripture because I preached this morning, but Roger done got me all fired up and stuff. Like I, had to, like I say, I put a little word in here too. So I'm going to just give you a brief uh, reading of John's Logos hymn, uh, the, first, the Gospel of John, his first chapter a little bit, and then one verse from 1 John, which I've been really digging into as I think about this. And then I'm going to talk to you a little bit, and when I'm done, you're going to turn and talk to each other. Does that sound like something you're up to? I will not make you sing. Um, Roger made you sing. It was amazing, right? But we do want to have a turn and talk. Now listen, listen to this. Um, listen to this word in scripture that is John the evangelist's nativity story, if you will. No angels, no shepherds. Listen, this is the message version. The word was first. The word present to God in readiness for God from day one. Everything that was created was created through the word, nothing created without the word. What came into existence was life, and life was the light to live by. What came into existence was life, and the life light blazed out of the darkness. The darkness couldn't put it out. The life light was the real thing. Every person entering into life, he brought in to the light. The light came to his own people, but they didn't want him. But whoever did want him, whoever believed he was who he claimed to be, he made to be their true selves, their child of God selves. These, these are the God begotten, not the blood begotten, not the flesh begotten, not the sex begotten. The word became flesh and blood, and moved into the neighborhood. And we saw the glory with our own eyes, the one of a kind glory, like father, like son, generous, inside and out, true from start to finish. And then this from 1 John. God is love. And those who take up residence in love take up residence in God, and God takes up residence in them. John the Evangelist, helping us understand God's incarnation, God's putting on itty-bitty baby flesh to come and live amongst us, to be with us, to be love and light and truth and the way, if you will, in the world. And those of us who were here in worship this morning heard me say, so I'll just repeat briefly, that this argument that John is making in these two texts 
is that the unique way, the one-of-a-kind way that God came to be in the world was to put on flesh to teach us what it is like to live a life of love. And then John goes on to say, when you live a life of love, God is also residing in you. God takes up residence in you. Now, I don't have time today to do the Christological, salvific, what does it mean to be saved by God talk? What does it mean to be atoned and redeemed by God? But I think John is trying to say more about why God came into the world as love and less about how Jesus got killed and raised again. I think, I think John is really saying that the love is the redempting quality, that the, that the, the incarnated, enfleshed word is the redeeming quality. That yes, historically, Jesus is killed, but John's not arguing God purposed the killing. John is arguing that God purposed the living and that God purposed the loving and that God purposed the particular enfleshment of love. Now, this is the thing that many of our Bible classes have not taught us. So this is move one of the lecture. God becomes flesh in a particular precise way. God becomes flesh to a family in Palestine, in Nazareth, which is Israel. These are not German people. I like German people, but these are not German people. These are Jewish people. They are Jewish people, and if you read any of the sort of hard to follow um, gen generational stories in the Gospels, you know that they are African and Jewish people. Nodding with me, like Roger got you singing, right? There's, there's nobody German in that list of people who begat the people who begat the people. There's no Dutch people in the begat the people begat the people. There's no, I'm married to a nice English German mutt kind of human. There's no, he's not, he's not, they're, they're not in there. Like Prego, like it's not in there. What's in there is African people. Like Moses and his wife. And Rahab, and I'm just so saying, African people, African Semitic people. God, first move, chose us to come all the way down into humanity to incarnate God's love in blackness. Oh my God, blackness! Right? I'm going to look that up. Yes, if you're going to look that up, look up Curtis T. Young, white man writing in a book called Coming Together about how this particular movement of God, movement of spirit, movement of life happens in blackness. He studied that from Cain Hope Belder, black man. I'm just saying, this is not argued. German scholars don't argue. <laughs> they know what time it is. If God chooses to come to the world inside black and Semitic, outsider, poor, nothing good comes out of Nazareth, to an unwed mother, scandalous, scandalous. Ain't nobody believe in that story about the angel? Not for a long time. <laughs> scandalous, homeless. This is how God chose to come to teach us about love. What if when you were in Sunday school, your Sunday school teacher had talked about how black Jesus was? And if your Sunday school teacher wasn't brave enough to go black, what if your Sunday school teacher was talking about how Jewish Jesus was. Can you imagine that many of us went to Sunday school and never really got it that Jesus was Jewish? Can, right? Yeah. Come on, raise your hand. Right? Like, <laughs> what? He's Jewish. What in the world? How, how in the world did... 
I want to say the word, the word, how in the heck <laughs> did our teachers not talk about the Jewishness of Yeshua ben Joseph? Why did we act like there was a God of the Old Testament and then suddenly a God of the New Testament and somehow these conversations, I mean, the Old Testament is Jesus' book. That's what he's preaching. That was he teaching. When the rich young ruler asked Jesus, well, can you tell me the best way to get to heaven? Or what's the biggest commandment? Which really means, tell me the best way to get to heaven. When the rich young ruler asked that question and Jesus says, listen, here it is. These two commands, love God with everything you have, heart, soul, mind, strength, love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus is quoting Deuteronomy and Leviticus, the first law and the second law. He's not making that up. Oh, God, make me Christian and tell me the law. No, he's quoting his Bible. He's quoting his Bible. He's quoting his Bible. In, in De Deuteronomy, it says, love God with all the things. That's the Hebrew Shema. You all know that word? The first word is Shema, hero Israel, right? So that's the Shema. And the Leviticus text is so precise in the Hebrew that I want to say it to you. Don't take vengeance, nor bear any grudge against the children of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Can you hear that? Don't bear, don't. Don't have a bad attitude. Don't be mad. Don't bear a grudge. Don't take out any vengeance on the children of your people, meaning my children, God is saying, because all of us are one family, but love your neighbor as yourself. So here's Jesus. So that's two things, right? He's black, Semitic, and black, and Jewish, and our Sunday school teachers miss that. Let's think about the nature of the United States of America and her founding. If those people who got on the boats, who came for religious freedom, got on the boat and came over here bringing with them the knowledge that their savior was black. Or at least Jewish. What would be the construct of religious freedom in this nation if the foundational text is Jesus, right? Word made flesh, and his Bible, Hebrew scriptures. How would our nation have been shaped around the otherness of the other? Think about it for a minute. They come here and they land and they see brown people who are indigenous people who own the land. I'm going to confess to you that I'm a pastor in the, forgive me, Roger, the Dutch Reformed Church in America. Uh, the Reformed Church in America, which was the Dutch people, we got a brand new name, but it's still us. The same people who were the Dutch in South Africa doing apartheid are the same Dutch people who stole, I'm sorry, bought Manhattan from the Lenape for no money and built a whole city on enslaved labor. Stole. Did I say stole? Yeah, stole. So, for 60 wampum or something. You feel me? What if, what if, what if those, those Dutch people that had learned from John Calvin, had learned from, you know, the Catholics, and had learned from Wesley, what if they had in their bodies that they were following an enfleshed body that was brown and poor? You get on the shores and you see some brown people. Are you, are you, trying, to, are you trying to skin them? and make one of their skins the cover of a book at Iliff? Are you thinking that you get to kidnap their children and, take, and try to un-Indian them? Are you thinking that the land belongs to you? Are, you? are you thinking that you can participate in the slave trade and still be a Christian, as were the clergy in my denomination? I just am saying, imagine. Move one, God made a choice <laughs> to come through Jewishness. And we forget it. And then we have the Holocaust. Whoa. Our theology of inclusion and anti-racism has to be grounded in our story. And our story is that we ignored what God was doing and did something different. Can you just nod with me on that? 
you didn't do it. I'm not yelling at you. I'm saying it was done. <laughs> and I wonder what would happen if we reverse that, if we re revisit that, if we think differently about the incarnation. Those of us who were here this morning heard me make the move that John isn't actually only saying believe in the incarnation. John isn't only saying believe God came and made flesh. Believe that. But John says, as he was in the world, so are you. John is making the move that all us, all y'all, are love and fleshed. Now let's think about that for just a minute. That God made a choice to come to marginalize outsider flesh, but to teach all of us that all of our flesh is holy. To teach all of us that inside us is love and light incarnate. That whenever we do love, whenever we be love, whenever we love in the world, this is what the text says, whenever we love, we are housing God. Right? We're housing God. This is God's house. We're welcoming God to our house. I didn't know you were going to sing that. But that worked, right? We're welcoming God to our house. And there's something about that knowledge that could, movement two, make us feel differently about ourselves and then also about our neighbor. Let me, let me unpack that for a minute. I'm convinced that part of the reason the world is so crazy and such a hot mess of anger and vitriol and violence is because there's a whole bunch of people walking around who don't love themselves. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Equal sign in the Greek, os. Love your neighbor as yourself. Same way. Well, maybe we're doing exactly what the Bible says. Maybe we're loving our neighbors exactly as the way we love ourselves. And since we don't love ourselves, we ain't loving nobody. Maybe. Maybe we're loving our neighbors as poorly as we love ourselves absolutely can only see the log in their eyes, see their faults, see their derisions. We don't love ourselves. We're ashamed of ourselves. This thing I'm connecting right here about the, what, the, what the people who didn't get the Sunday school lesson did in America is shameful. But if we don't take a look at that carefully, we're just walking around feeling ashamed. And then if we're walking around feeling ashamed, we are not motivated to love each other. And we don't love ourselves, so we can't love each other. You see what I'm trying to do? Like, that happened. And reparations are due, and restoration is due. But I'm talking about you and me, loving ourselves enough to say, I'm imperfect, and I'm in progress. Say it with me. I am imperfect, and I am in progress. I am imperfect, and I am in progress. And the best thing about me is God in me. How do we, it's almost sacrilegious to not love ourselves. If we're house of the holy, are you? If, if God is love and, and that love put on flesh and John and his next letter are like, you are the place where God lives. Can you look in the mirror and not love that? Well, you can with all the messages in America about how not to. I'm too black. I'm too white. <laughs> I'm too queer. I'm too... Straight, I'm too feminine, I'm too butch, I'm too poor, I'm too unintelligent, I'm not learned, I'm not wealthy, I've been hurt, and I haven't recovered. All of the lists of things in America, in the culture, in the narrative that is America that says you are not good enough to love you. And then we overcompensate with a whole bunch of other stuff. Drink, work too much, buy a bunch of stuff. All of these things intended to fill in the hole that's in our soul because we don't really love ourselves. Am I talking too fast? Are you staying with me? Are you with me? Oh my goodness, think of all of the things. My people aren't really the right people. I'm a mixed kid. I was adopted. Make the, in your own mind. The stories in your mind that have been put in your mind to tell you you're not the one when you are exactly the one God is waiting for <laughs> to make love in the world, right? So movement two is, movement one, we gotta get our story straight. 
What was God doing when God had that intention to come into the world this way? That, we gotta get that story straight. Number two, we have to get it inside God's intention for us, which is for us to love ourselves, really to love ourselves, to forgive ourselves our trespasses, to have grace and patience with ourselves, to, to, to give ourselves a, a permission to start from scratch and to rebuild what's broken and to put at the core of our identity, I am really a child of God. Now, what happens if we put... I? I am a co-heir with Jesus. Jesus is incarnate flesh. I am incarnate flesh. Jesus was an outsider. I can, I can do an outsider business for a couple days. I, I can rewire what's important. I can love me. And when I love me, I can look at the black, brown, indigenous, Asian, Latinx, Hispanic, queer, broke, poor, sick, overweight, Muslim, in a hijab, Jewish person in a kippah, those other kind of Christians that we don't like. Ooh. <laughs> you know I mean? They're so crazy. I think they're crazy too, but I'm trying to. <laughs> but I'm trying to love everybody, right? <laughs> what happens if we make that move? I know I'm imperfect, and I know I'm beloved. And that one is imperfect and beloved. This one is imperfect and beloved, and that one's imperfect and beloved. And those beautiful boys, y'all are hot, <laughs> are imperfect and beloved. So then when you see these beautiful young men walking down the street, I'm not talking about y'all, because I know you don't do this, but lots of white people do. When you see these young people walking down the street, you think, they are really good looking boys, look at those boys. Wonder what college they go to. Wonder what they do for a living, as opposed to clutching our purses and crossing the street. Because they are incarnate love. And when you say, hey, baby, how you doing? They're going to be like, hello, ma'am. And you're not afraid anymore. Because they belong to God and you belong to God. That's the move we have to make. That's the move we have to make. This is how we're going to get to anti-racism from the inside out. We're going to look inside, the stories we've been told the stuff we've been taught to believe, the stereotypes we injected. We couldn't help it. We're just in this culture, you know. Who, who, who saw some black smart people growing up? Two of you. You didn't go to college with us. You didn't live next to us. You didn't see us on TV being brilliant, badass. I mean, amazing. <laughs> you didn't see it. But it's here, okay? And, and our job in this generation, in our life, is to say, this is, the, this is America. Beautiful, strong, gifted, black, young men killing it in the world, being nice to their parents, raising kids, doing good stuff. And yes, some of them lost, like some of the young white boys. But we got to let go of these old stories. We got to stop thinking in the box and the categories and the, what, you know, what did I learn about Latinx people? Oh, they're loud and they like red and they can dance. You know, what did I learn about Asian people? Oh, they can play the violin and they're good at math, you know. Uh, what did I learn about indigenous people? They're all alcoholics and they don't, you know. Come on. Right there at the tip of our tongue are the stories we've been told that are lies. Because all of that broad stroke is a lie. Child of God, that's the truth. Worthy of love, amen. Worthy of dignity, amen. Right? Okay, so one, the story starts with God being particular, making a radical, revolutionary choice about how to come into the world. Just shorthand, not German, right? That says, make that move, right? Not German. Two, the intention of the incarnation is not there's one unique revelation of God in the world. It's all of us as human are a unique representation of God's love in the world, and that ought to make us love us. And if we three can love us, we can love our neighbor. That's it. And there's a whole bunch of so what's, and, you know, Jenny will have me back. 
right? But those are the foundational places. I want you to be able to read this book as a guide to fierce love of yourself first so you can love your neighbor and that we can heal the world, right? I know I gotta go, but let me invite you to think about uh, two questions with me um, and you'll talk about them together and Jenny will pull it out of you. She's good at that, I think, right? Question one is, when did you know that there was a thing called race? Like, when did you know? For me, I'm five, I'm happy, well-adjusted, little girl calls me the N-word for the first time. That, that was my baptism into American racism. When did you know there was a thing called race? And how did you know it? How did you find it out? Right? I'm going to want you to turn and talk to somebody about that. How did, you, how did you find out that there was a thing called race? Right? And the second thing, and this is a little bit, just a little bit different. If I say the system that created the race in the world, right? Like the system the whole systemic racist world. I'm gonna call that whiteness for shorthand, okay? It's whiteness, you, you, many of you are not shocked to hear me say that. White supremacy, white supremacy, blah, blah, blah. Just let's call that the system that creates categories, hierarchy, caste, power, that says white is better, white theology is better, white music is better, white books are better, white skin is better. That system, I'm gonna call whiteness. Where does whiteness touch you? Where does whiteness touch you? White people are touched by whiteness. I could say, how does it cripple you? How does it hurt you? But pick a word. How, does it, how do you encounter whiteness? Okay? And that'll be enough for today. I'm, I'm suggesting that whiteness hurts all of us. It, might, it advantages many of us, but I'm going to suggest it hurts all of us. So I want you to just think about where whiteness, the systems, hierarchy, touch you. And I'm done for today. I got, I gotta go. I gotta go. But listen, Titus Burgess wrote the song. I sat back waiting. Anticipating, can you hear me? At some point, change would begin. But then it hit me, I was what was missing. My weight was dead. That's why we can't get ahead. You and I are the ones we've been waiting for. You and I thought this was somebody else's war. You and I were the ones the ones we've been waiting for. Peace. So friends, Jackie and John are literally leaving right now to go make sure they get on their plane. But she's, she means business about this Talk to your neighbor. Yeah, I do. Sit John, down and talk. That's right. Sit down <laughs> right now. Roger is going to play for us some, some music you. just for a few minutes. Thank you. While we take seriously these questions, where did race start? Where did you understand race? You know what, you know what that question means. Turn to somebody you know and maybe somebody you don't know. A group of two, three, four, you can move the chairs. But I'm going to report back on you, so don't worry. Where did race begin? Where did you first understand that? And then how does whiteness, how does whiteness touch you? Maybe how it harms all of us and how it also harms the world. So let's take a few minutes and then we'll turn it over. You can play some music while they think and creatively come to this, but blessings. I feel like I'm city. <laughs>
Let's wrap up our conversations. Um, take it like 30 seconds and kind of wrap up and remind yourself of what you're talking about so that you can take it with you and continue the conversation. Um, I will re report back to Jackie Lewis. Don't worry about all this work and what you're talking about. But I'm going to turn it over to Roger Holland and our musicians to kind of lead us out. And then we'll have another word from our artist, Rochelle Johnson. Oh, Lord. 
Thank you. He's just doing his thing, Deborah, and I'm, we're living into this space together. Thank you. Uh, in a moment, I hope you've had a chance to enjoy the lovely art, the visual art. Like This is all art, whether it's the, the fingertips of the musicians or it's just the curation of a space and a time and an energy. But So this is all about lifting up the arts. As we know throughout history, art is always involved, the arts, right? at the intersection of creating a new venture, justice, right? Art is the heart of justice. Within activism, art is the inspiration that invites us into what is next, what we can't always see, but what is coming, right? It's building. So building a coalition means artists and artistry coming together, and that is where spirit, the one of first Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, right? There is art in the creation, in the creator, so this art, this visual art that is lining in the halls in our narthex um, are the, the fingerprints and the story and the pain and the resilience of one belev beloved human being who sees the world through a particular lens. And her name is Rochelle Johnson. Rochelle grew up in Park Hill and has a really particular story, right? This particular thing that God did and is doing Rochelle has a particular story to tell, and I know you'll get that when you experience the art that she has offered. But I do want you to meet her and hear from her own lips, her own story, um, the story behind this visual. She tells it in a beautiful way. So Rochelle Johnson, we would just love to hear more from you, and thank you for being here. Thank you for allowing your art to light up our space. I spent the morning here and have been listening um, to everything that's been going on today. And I am so, I, I, I just want to say, look how good God is. Um, I had no idea when I was invited by Adrian Miller what this was all about. And I just said, I'll do it, you know. Um, <laughs> You always have to try to get your artwork out in front of people. And um, this is directly in line with what my work speaks about. I have two series, um, one speaking about gentrification in my neighborhood, which is Five Points. And then the other one is called Blue World, which speaks about race and identity and how if we could set aside skin color um, how we would be considered more as humans, human beings, and humanity could go forward. So this um, lecture to today was so powerful for me, and I hope you all got something out of it as well. But um, please come back and talk to me. Look at the art. Um, I'm also a resident at Redline um, Art Center, and to see more of the Blue World series, come, come see me there. It's on um, Arapahoe Street, 23rd and Arapahoe. The address is 2350 Arapahoe Street in the Five Points neighborhood. And it's an art center that houses artists in their studios on the perimeter and a gallery in the middle of the um, facility. So um, come check us out. Come check me out. I would love to talk to you in my studio and show you my art. In the meantime, please come see my art in the back and talk to me. Thank you. Thank you. In some spaces, we might refer to this song as a sending forth, <laughs> a commissioning, if you would. We've heard some powerful messages today through the lecture, the preached word, um, and in the songs. 
And I, I truly believe that the Holy Spirit has orchestrated all of this. And so I charge you and I challenge you in the spirit of what we have seen and heard today to go forth and not simply ponder, calling to heart to that nativity business, not simply ponder in your hearts what you have seen and heard, but to do something with that, to go forth and be active where we get the word activists. Bringing it back into the church and where we started today or where I started with you, let's ask God to prepare us for the work that we have been challenged to do today. To love ourselves, amen? Come on, you can do better than that. To love ourselves, amen? And it starts with accepting the love of God and the Spirit of God within us. As, as Reverend Dr. Jackie Lewis said, we are all made in God's image and we are divine creation. We are all valuable and we need to treat one another and ourselves as though we are valuable and divine. Let us ask the Spirit of the living God to dwell within us. And when the Spirit of God dwells within us, we become convicted to be that which God has called us to be and to do, right?
For some time, a perfect storm has been brewing, writes Jackie. One that polarizes, amplifying the power of divergent ideologies and reducing our differences to shallow and bigoted categories in which we are vehemently against them. Put simply, we are in a perilous time. And the answer to the question, who are we to be, will have implications for generations to come. We have a choice to make. Can you hear her saying that to you? She's saying that to you right now. You, we have a choice to make. We can answer this question with diminished imagination by closing ranks with our tribe and hiding from our human responsibility to heal the world. Or we can answer the question of who we are by another way. And some of you know this way. We can answer in the spirit of Ubuntu. The concept comes from the Zulu phrase, something, something, something. Three lovely words. Which literally means that a person is a person through other people. A person is a person through other people. Where have we heard that before? In the beginning, God created. In the beginning, there was life. In Genesis 2, it actually says that God said to the waters, produce living things. It would have been much easier for God to just say, here's a dolphin, here's a whale. But God, in the spirit of co-creation, said, living waters, produce living things. Create with me. Bring about new life with me. We know that a person is a person through other people. Wow. When Zulus see each other, they offer this greeting, Sawabona, which means, I see you. I see you. We've heard so much this weekend. We've heard so much in one minute sound bites that could last our lifetime of learning and receiving wisdom and putting the pieces together. Last night we heard stories of resilience out of racism. We heard a reminder of our co-created belonging that we do in fact belong to each other. We have been sung into another universe by people who know it, who breathe it, who live it. Church, friends, We have a choice to make. Will we live from a place of diminished imagination? Are we, will we dream together something bigger and bolder and more radical than we understand? Will we look on the street and see our beloved neighbors in a different skin than us and say, I see you. When we see each other, we see the face of God. May it be so for you this day and for all of us, all of our days. Amen. Go in peace.